Hello, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Art Museum's Art Speaks program. My name is Jessica Kennedy, and I am the educator for adult learning at the museum. Before we begin, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A section located on your screen. Feel free to enter your questions at any time during the program, and we will choose a few to answer at the end. Also, there is live auto transcription available for this program. Please click the CC icon to activate or deactivate the subtitles. For today's talk, Tanita Pena and Modern Pueblo Painting, we are joined by Alexander Marr, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Assistant Curator of Native American Art. Thanks for being here today, Alex. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome to all who join us this afternoon. I'm speaking from the offices of the St. Louis Art, St. Louis Art Museum in Forest Park. The St. Louis region is the ancestral territory of multiple Native American peoples, including descendants of the Mississippian civilization that built Cahokia and mounds in St. Louis early in the last millennium. Later, in the 18th and 19th centuries, colonial settlement disrupted indigenous relations with this place. The Osage Nation and members of the Illini Confederacy, including the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma, know the St. Louis region as part of their homelands. I also want to recognize the diversity of Native peoples who live and work in St. Louis today. This land acknowledgement represents only one step in a broader process of reversing historical practices of erasure and denial. Earlier, th earlier this year, the museum installed Gallery 323 with highlights of Southwestern Native American art from the collection. Most works in this gallery date to the decades around 1900, an era marked by economic transformation in New Mexico, Arizona, and California, following the arrival of rail and subsequent onset of the tourist industry. In this gallery, you will see some of the most iconic forms of Native American art, including Pueblo ceramics and Diné or Navajo silver jewelry at left here, and as well as Diné weaving and California basketry at right. Since the early 20th century, indigenous artists have also used media associated with Euro-American fine art practices. The wall at left in this slide features a changing presentation of drawings, prints, and photographs. We will display a sequence of works on paper here for six months each. This limited display time helps restrict light exposure for these sensitive media. Through the series of rotations, we are excited to share the breadth of styles, materials, and subjects that Native American graphic artists in the Southwest have engaged over the past century. The goal here is not to present studio-based works as a departure from ancestral practices, but rather to position a continuum where modern and, conten and contemporary forms become a point of reference, a guide to help visitors see historical weavings and sculpture through the lenses of experimentation, cosmopolitanism, and multivalence. Today, we will explore in detail the first work in the cycle of rotations and the oldest work in the series, Basket Dance by Tonita Pena. In the bottom row, women use their whitened hands to grasp evergreen boughs and baskets. Behind, men hold boughs and rattles. Women wear leggings, black woven mantas and white cloaks, while men wear woven kilts, sashes, and animal pelts from their waist and red paint over their bodies. All lift their right feet in unison, face left, and open their mouths in song. Pena represents one moment in an unfolding ritual drama. Donita Pena, also known by the Tewa language name Kwa A was the sole woman in the first self-taught generation of indigenous easel painters in northern New Mexico. Previously, Pueblo artists painted imagery and abstractions on the surfaces of ceramic vessels and walls of buildings such as sacred kivas. Pena's generation of easel painters, active through the decades following World War I, frequently depicted Pueblo dances. Pueblo communities in New Mexico and Arizona perform a range of ceremonies, including masked dances for restricted audiences and unmasked dances such as this for a more open viewership. 
these communal prayers progress through annual cycles with each group following a distinct calendar. In Pueblo religious contexts, dances help to control weather, cure, or ensure fertility and abundance. Dances have also come to re represent Pueblo heritage and cultural survival. The basket dance historically takes place during the spring, and today most Pueblos perform it on Eastern weekend. Many Pueblos practice the basket dance, including San Ildefanzo or Pauhoge in the Tewa language. Citizens of Cochiti Pueblo, where the Karis language is also spoke, is spoken, also enact the basket dance. Peña moved there to Cochiti in her adolescence to live with her aunt following the death of her mother. Aside from high school in Santa Fe, Peña continued to live in Cochiti. She married Cochiti men and participated in the life of the community. The basket dance was a favored subject for Peña. Historically associated with womanhood, the basket dance prominently features female dancers. Here we see other compositions by the artist that depict various moments in this ceremony. At left, a single female figure demonstrates the first half of the dance, a slow standing procession. A stylized cloud drops rain above her head, while a cartouche based on geometric abstractions from ceramic painting rises below her feet. The figure gently lifts her right foot, culling up the principal step of Pueblo dances. This consists of slightly raising one foot and bending the opposite knee. The rhythm of the step emphasizes the lowering of the right foot. At right, Peña depicted the second half of the dance. A woman kneels and scrapes notched sticks above the overturned basket, which amplifies the sound. In front of her, a male dancer steps in place, shakes his rattle, and sings. Compared to other depictions of the basket dance by Peña, the slam work features a greater number of figures. Here, the outstanding sense of scale and complexity convey the embodied experience of observing a Pueblo dance. Rigid and repetitive movements help Pueblo dancers achieve a particular sense of collectivity, one that contains and unifies a multitude of subtle differences between individuals. Peña successfully represents this dynamic tension through a linear composition and rich variations in each figure. Note the distinctions in posture and height, the unique designs on the baskets, and the downy feathers that alternate directions on the heads of the dancers. As the artist asserted about her figures in a letter from 1921, quote, I paint just the way they wear their dresses, end quote. These loving details reflect the knowledge of regalia Peña accrued through her participation in dances over many years. Let's explore one element the artist represented with meticulous clarity and what it tells us about her interest in Southwestern Native American art. The ancestors of Pueblo peoples were expert weavers, though by the 20th century, most Pueblos in Northern New Mexico acquired baskets through trade. The baskets here are made by Hickoria Indi or Apache women who had through centuries of artistic exchange around the upper Rio Grande, learned basket weaving from Pueblo teachers. A coiled basket from the early 20th century by a Hickoria artist at left shows the style of design, coloration, and construction of the vessels in Peña's painting. Cochiti women acquired these baskets and other regalia at intertribal ceremonies and Pueblo dances. It was also common for artists from other indigenous groups to travel through the Pueblos during seasons of intensive dancing. In addition to their role in the dance, women at Cochiti winnowed wheat with coiled hickoria baskets. The use of baskets in this dance has been widely recognized as a form of supplication for agricultural fertility and abundance. What I am interested in pointing out here is the way that Peña's careful attention to the basket design helps to locate this dance scene in time and place. Hickoria weavers in the early 20th century engaged the vibrancy of powdered aniline dyes to weave geometric abstractions in bold contrasting colors. These dyes arrived on the market in the last decades of the 19th century. So their appearance in Hickoria baskets 
demonstrates how indigenous artists in the Southwest not only became experts in learned forms and techniques, uh, such as coiling baskets, but also selectively incorporated new media in ancestral practices. In Peña's painting, the modern Hickoria basket hints at the cosmopolitan markets and materials that sustained Pueblo ritual dramas. Peña's deliberate engagement with detail not only reflected her firsthand knowledge of modern dance regalia, but also her keen awareness of her audience's beliefs and desires. Dance scenes made up the primary subject of the then emerging genre of Pueblo watercolors, which found a ready market among the circle of artist patrons, archaeologists, and other preservation-minded cultural leaders in Santa Fe at the time. The group took a broad interest in Pueblo culture, seeking to preserve and restore what they understood to be its essential features. Boosters valued indigenous cultural expression as a curative for problems wrought by industrial modernity in the United States, namely the alienation of the self from community, nature, and labor. Pena's alignment of dancers in orderly rows, depiction of collective action, and detailing of non-Christian religion may be seen as buttressing the perception of Pueblo culture as uh, essentially communal, holistic, and incompatible with modernity. However, the materials that Pena used, her familiarity with external markets, and subtle references in the painting, such as the inclusion of aniline dyes in the baskets, demonstrates the ways that indigenous artists engaged modernity on their own terms. By December 1920, Pena started selling work to the Museum of New Mexico, an institutional outgrowth of the School of American Archaeology in Santa Fe. The museum provided Pena and other San Ildefonso artists materials to create watercolors of dance scenes, then purchased their finished works. At the museum, researchers collaborated with contemporary indigenous peoples as a way to extend the methods, goals, and scope of archeological work. Seeing modernity as a threat to what they defined as authentic indigenous culture, museum leaders sought to generate detailed documents for the historical record. As correspondence between Pena and museum officials demonstrate, however, the artist viewed her work and the distinctly modern market of the museum collection as a critical source of income. By the mid 1920s, individuals and gallery owners purchased Pena's, water, purchased Pena's watercolors, helping to move recognition of Pueblo easel painting from the realm of anthropology to fine art. For instance, the wealthy patron Elizabeth White was a major supporter of Pena's work, selling Pena's pictures at her New York gallery in the 1920s and donating the works to art museums across the country in the mid 1930s. The relationships that Pena and other Pueblo painters developed with patrons in Santa Fe became bridges to national and international exhibitions and museum collections. This work is a significant acquisition in the history of the St. Louis Art Museum. We acquired it along with another watercolor by a Pueblo artist, I should say we purchased it uh, with another watercolor by a Pueblo artist, Felino Shia Herrera's Winter Dance, in late 1932 from the Spanish and Indian Trading Company, a fine art gallery in Santa Fe. This marked the first purchase of Native American art for the museum, and one of the first museum purchases outside New Mexico of modern Pueblo painting. When the museum acquired these works in 1932, that was preparing to present a major touring exhibition a survey of Native American art. From 1931 to 1933, Peña's and Herrera's other works toured the country in the blockbuster Exposition of Indian Tribal Arts, organized in part by the American painter John Sloan. The museum archives features correspondence between director Myrick Rogers and the organizers of the tour, indicating that plans for the St. Louis presentation of the Exposition of Indian Tribal Arts began early in 1931, a year and a half before the museum purchased the pair of modern Pueblo paintings. The, expo the exposition showed at the St. Louis Art Museum then from, from November 4th to December 2nd, 1933. 
In the early 1930s, Pena participated in multiple initiatives for national audiences. Here, Pena paints a mural panel for a New Deal era program in, the early, in early 1934. For this project, Pena lived and worked at the federally run Santa Fe Indian School, which was in the midst of institutionalizing many of the conventions Pena helped to shape over the preceding decade. It is fascinating to reflect on the role of federal schools in Pena's career. As a child at the San Ildefonso Day School from 1899 to 1905, Pena first used watercolors to depict ceremonial dances. This represented a ped pedagogical experiment. At that time, art instruction at federal schools for indigenous children more typically focused on skills tied to wage-based employment, such as lace making, naturalistic illustration, or woodworking. These early forays in easel painting provided critical for Pena and a generation of children from San Ildefonso who went on to work professionally as easel painters. The new media of watercolors was not Pena's only formative experience creating art. She also apprenticed in the more customary Pueblo women's practice of ceramics. When the 12 year old Pena moved to Cochiti, she lived with her aunt and uncle, the accomplished ceramicist ceramicists Martina Vigil and Florentino Montoya. She helped her relatives make vessels, keeping moist the rising rims while Vigil rolled the next coils, as well as applying slip and polishing the whole vessels. Pena also created her own ceramics. In addition to the historical need for jars and bowls at home and for trade with other indigenous peoples, Cochiti artists capitalized on tourist desires for souvenirs along the new rail line in the late 19th century, as well as the new markets of museum collections across North America. For, for instance, the jar it left by V. Hill and Montoya entered the collection of the Milwaukee Public Museum when it was new. It demonstrates the innovations for which the couple wanted claim, including a vertical, slightly convex neck shape invented by V. Hill. Observing recent changes to markets for ceramics, Pena understood how Puebla women may forge careers as professional artists. In addition to her detailed representations of dance trappings, Pena depicted the cycle of pottery production in a series of watercolors, coiling and shaping, applying, applying slip to the exterior, painting designs, arranging vessels in the firing pit, firing, and the use of pottery in domestic settings. In this work, Pena transfers intricate designs from ceramic walls to the flat page. She shows an intergenerational group of women painting jars. Absorbed in their work, they mirror the focus and movement Pena performed to create this watercolor. We may interpret Pena's representations of ceramics as a logical extension of her interest in the details and surfaces of other Southwestern art forms, such as the baskets and textiles in ceremonial performances. I'm also tempted to see this subject as Pena's effort to connect her modern paintings with earlier forms of indigenous artistic labor and aesthetic thought. In other words, to foreground the economic and conceptual dimensions of her subjects. Let me say more. If dance scenes were the dominant subject in the early years of Pueblo easel painting, then one critical aspect seems to be missing from the convention, the setting of the dances. For reference, here's a photograph of uh, Pueblo Plaza and the Catholic churchyard uh, with the plaza visible at right and the churchyard um, at left. Now plazas are the settings for Pueblo dances, uh, for most Pueblo dances, I should say. At top right, terrace departments create platforms for viewing the ritual action on the ground. Now this photograph shows the Pueblo of Zia, but the general arrangement of terraced apartments overlooking plazas extends across the Pueblo world. I'm sorry, this photograph shows the Pueblo of Zuni, uh, but the arrangement uh, holds across the Pueblo world. Tewa architect and theorist Renus Wenzel analyzes the boundaries of the Bupinga, or plaza at the center of Pueblo settlements. Swenzel writes, quote, much like a pot, the walls that define, define the bupinga are hand molded and plastered, 
traditionally by women and children, with the stuff of the earth, end quote. Plaza walls, created with the same materials as ceramics and by the same hands, form voids that contain multitudes. According to Swainsell, songs and prayers describe this world, quote, as a contained spherical unit. Similarly, Tewa anthropologist Alfonso Ortiz describes a general Pueblo worldview based on a conception of space that extends horizontally in the four cardinal directions and vertically through three or four cosmic levels. Uniting these dimensions, Puebloan people classify space with a, quote, well-elaborated conception and symbolization of the middle or center of the cosmos, end quote. This center or earth navel is often represented by a sipapu, a stone partially buried in a stone in a dance plaza. When filled with dancers, the dimensions of the world converge in the center place and unlike things join to form a unity. So why omit the setting in modern Pueblo paintings of dances? One explanation has to do with the role of patrons who sought to cultivate an essentialist aesthetic. Earlier forms of painting, including ceramics and murals, were seen as prototypes for compositions in easel painting, and patrons expressed preferences for groundless figuration. A handful of the earliest watercolors from 1919 and 1920 feature landscapes, though the near total absence of this setting in following years has led some scholars to argue for the power of patrons' tastes. Linking this preference for groundlessness to earlier forms of Pueblo painting uh, and other media, we can see that some ceramics from San Ildefonso demonstrate formal relations with the watercolors. Note the avian and floral figures in the central band of this water jar, which seem to float over a blank space. Another set of interpretations uh, relates unarticulated backgrounds to Pueblo perspectives. Viewed from terraces above, dancers stand against the broad expanse of ground of a plaza. Alternately, the art historian Sasha Scott convincingly argues that artists developed conventions of neutral backgrounds as a way of abstracting the subject and thus prohibiting external audiences from inhabiting or reconstructing uh, the dances and thus consuming their esoteric meanings. Scott provides a fascinating framework for recognizing indigenous agency as a form of withholding, a strategy for maintaining limits on cultural property in the context of transcultural markets. Indeed, when some Cochiti community members expressed concern about painting subjects, she successfully reassured them that she only painted the unmasked dances that were open to any visitor. If Pena restricted access to esoteric knowledge, however, she nonetheless sought to connect modern Pueblo painting to past artistic labor and experimentation, as well as aesthetic principles grounded in notions of space. Pena and her contemporaries inspired the next generation of artists, many of whom studied in the famous studio program at the Santa Fe Indian School during the 1930s. Uh, this includes Vincente Mirabal. In this painting from 1939, Mirabal incorporates architectural elements into dance scenes, a shift from the earlier practice. The subject of the picture and use of flat areas of color remained consistent with earlier models. This style of painting would uh, continue to be the dominant mode of Native American graphic art through the 1950s. The next generation within, uh, through the 1950s. Later in the 1960s, a new generation of artists would break through the calcifying strictures of so-called Indian painting. Fritz Scholder is widely recognized for developing new formal and conceptual possibilities for native figuration in the post-war period. This monotype will be on view in Gallery 323 from the first, in the first half of uh, 2023, part of the series of rotations that will follow the presentation of Peña's basket dance. Scholder reimagined 19th century photographic portraits 
works that had come to define Native Americans in the popular imaginary. Here, he collapses the distinction between figure and ground, converting a woven design into a crown for the Diné or Navajo woman, Hadipa. At the same time, he obscured the figure's facial features to withhold her personal identity. Using gestural brushwork, Shoulder redirects attention from the likeness of the subject to her interior psychological conditions. Through these formal interventions, Shoulder suggests that historical photographs have established effectively a rubric for the recognition and uh, most critically regulation of indigenous identities. Other works in the rotation sequence reflect continuing innovations by indigenous graphic artists in the Southwest. In this print by Dan Lomahoftawa, a figure faces forward towards viewers and tilts his head. As a participant in a ritual dance, the man wears armbands, uh, feathers in his shoulders, jewelry around his neck, and a white cotton kilt. A frame encloses the stylized figure, perhaps the artist's sly visual commentary on the long-standing practice of exoticizing indigenous Pueblo dancers in the visual culture of the United States. Active as a painter and printmaker in the 1980s and 90s, Dan Lomahoftawa created highly personal contemporary reflections on Pueblo religious iconography. As he said in a 1995 interview, Pueblo dance relates to, quote, a very old structure, but as it happens, it's as contemporary as that jet flying over the Mesa. It's real, end quote. Cara Romero's Coyote Tales number no. one is the most recent addition to the story of Southwestern graphic art in the museum collection. Here, three finger figures stand casually in front of an adobe building. At top left, a neon sign identifies the location as Saints and Sinners, a liquor store and bar in Española, New Mexico, near the Pueblo of Santa Clara. The figures gather around the hood of a 1964 Chevrolet Impala modified as a lowrider, a style associated with Española car culture. The work shows a specific, if everyday, place in the American Southwest. Yet a pink pall transforms the scene and implies a powerful unknown presence. The central figure turns to present the tale of Coyote, a trickster in many Native American stories who is responsible for unforeseen events, good and bad. The glowing sign confirms Coyote's double-edged power in this scene. Demonstrating the abiding significance of indigenous stories, this work suggests how cultural knowledge helps Native American people to inhabit and animate post-industrial American cityscapes. Romero likens her photographic practice to the work of a storyteller. Across her oeuvre, the artist carefully stages figures and magical realist compositions that expand popular narratives of indigenous culture and identity. Romero is uh, based in Santa Fe and her work is in the collections of uh, LACMA, the Minneapolis Institute, the Nelson Atkins and the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, like Shoulder and Loma Haftawa, she responds to past representations of Native peoples, yet she moves away from direct engagement with existing images and subjects to orchestrate new scenes of Indigenous vitality and strength. This photograph will appear in Gallery 323 this December, bringing the narrative of Southwestern Indigenous graphic art close to the present day. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Alex. Um, you can go ahead and leave your PowerPoint up. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, please uh, submit them. Um, I actually had a question to start us off. Uh, you mentioned, um, you actually quoted uh, Pena in your talk, and I'm wondering, did she write a lot about her artwork? Yeah, so the quote is from a series of correspondence uh, with the Museum of New Mexico. Um, so it's it's not a publication that she uh, created during her lifetime. Uh, the short answer is no, uh, but we we are able to understand how she um, presented her work to really her earliest patron, which was the Museum of New Mexico through this series of correspondence. Great, great, thank you. Um, okay, we do have one question here. 
Um, and this is specific to Pena's Basket Dance um, uh, watercolor. Yeah, I'll go back. Um, they ask, so would the basket dance with its repetitive movements be considered meditative? Um, it may be considered, considered meditative. Um, you know, it's really part, but it's also an active dance. Um, so um, individuals are certainly uh, the, the kind of uh, core constituent in a, in a Pueblo dance, but it's really um, a collective and communal form of, of prayer. Uh, so there are absolutely religious aspects which relate to some of the esoteric meanings that, that I was hinting at before. Um, for the individual dancer, that probably depends on, on the person. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yes, there is a question here. Um, the basket dance is a watercolor, correct? Yes. Um, let's see. And what time of year would this dance be performed? I feel like you said spring, perhaps? Springtime, yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the Pueblos perform it on Easter weekend. Hmm. Is that directly connected to Christianity? Is there overlap with Christianity? There are really interesting, um, that's, a, that's a big question. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, but um, there are elements of Christianity which are threaded into each Pueblo's uh, calendar of ritual, ritual dramas. And the, the most apparent um, element of that has to do with the timing. So there are dances held at Easter, um, at Christmas. Each Pueblo has a um, patron saint, basically. And so the name day of the saint will have dances. The, the dances themselves are seen as indigenous um, in their origin. Some dances include um, include uh, including public dances, uh, altars that have crosses on on the tables. Um, so there's a pretty interesting interesting mix there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you for answering that big question. <laughs> yeah, and of course, in the in the Mirabal um, watercolor, you know, this is the uh, mm -hmm. church at Taos, and so you can see the use of the pueblo in front. I'm sorry, use of the plaza in front of the churchyard as a dance ground. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for today. So I just want to say thank you so much, Alex, for this. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, if you'd like, register to join us next Thursday, October 7th at noon, for our very first installation of a series of talks related to the exhibition that opens this weekend. Uh, that exhibition is titled Art Along the Rivers. Uh, and Thursday's talk will include an introduction to the exhibition by curator Melissa Wolf and a conversation with artist Norman Akers, who is a citizen of the Osage Nation and whose artwork is featured in the exhibition. You can register for that program series and more at slam.org events. And thank you all and have a great day.